Good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on Mi'kmaq territory. For those of you who wish, I'd like for you to stand and help me pray. Great Spirit, great grandfather of all, we come before you as your children. We represent the four races of humanity, the white, the yellow, the red, and the black. We come before you with many cultures, many traditions, and many ceremonies. Standing together shoulder to shoulder, we share those things amongst ourselves. Great Spirit, we ask that you bless our children, our grandparents, our elders, and all of our seniors, that you bless all things that have spirit. We ask that you keep them safe in times of COVID and otherwise. We ask that you bless those who are lost and forlorn. We ask that you help to heal those who are sick. Great Spirit, we ask that you look after those who look after us. All of our ministers and government have done a beautiful job of looking after us and keeping us safe. We ask that you keep our military safe and those all across Turtle Island in the world. We pray for Mother Earth that she continue to be able to provide for us and to keep our bellies full. Great Spirit, please bless us and help us to continue to be strong and come together as one. Let our hearts beat as one. We say these words with open minds, open hearts, with much love to you on this day. All my relations, Tahoe, amen. Thank you. Just bear with me while I do the usual. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you for joining us for this very special announcement. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are in Mi'kmaq, the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people. As you know, we are in the midst of a very important moment in our time. Systemic racism, discrimination, injustices faced by people of color and other communities have garnered public awareness and have sparked intense debates. Decision makers in all institutions including law enforcement, can no longer ignore what is broken, what is not fair, and what is discriminatory. My personal experiences with law enforcement across this country have not always been positive. It is personal for me because it's personal for so many people in my community. And unfortunately, my experiences are not unique. Law enforcement and what we know to be public safety needs to change. And that includes the actions of the individuals who serve within. Our racially marginalized and diverse communities continue to advocate and take action for that change. And I want to thank them for that. However, positive change is a shared responsibility and it is needed in order for us to have full 
inclusion in all institutions. It is important that we carry on the work of having a just and equal society. That's what every generation has fought for. And this event today, which is making me sweat terribly, <laughs> is another step in that direction. So I'd like to now introduce my colleague and friend, Minister Mark Fury, Minister of Justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, good morning, everyone. As the Minister of Justice for Nova Scotia, uh, much of my reflection has been on the role of public safety and justice in our communities. Every Nova Scotian should feel safe and protected by our justice system. But we know not all Nova Scotians do. The Black Lives Matter protests have echoed the findings of many reports. Their findings show that justice systems across the country, including here in Nova Scotia, from policing to prosecution through to sentencing and corrections, are systemically racist. These systems reflect and perpetuate anti-black racism and racism against Indigenous people and other marginalized communities. The Department of Justice bears significant responsibility for the historical and current reality that our justice system has been structured to the benefit of some and not all Nova Scotians. It will take the full attention and commitment of the Department of Justice and justice system partners many of them represented here today, to achieve the fundamental change that is required. As the Minister of Justice, I acknowledge my responsibilities and pledge the full commitment and support of the Nova Scotia Department of Justice. We are here today, collectively, to support the Premier's announcement of a new path forward to a safer and more just Nova Scotia for all. With those few remarks, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the Premier of the Province of Nova Scotia, my good friend, Stephen McNeil. Uh, thank you, Ministers. I want to thank all of you uh, for being here, including those who are watching on the live stream. Today I brought a speech with me. I don't often do that, but because, but because there's so much I don't know and quite frankly so much that I don't understand. I wanted to get this right and to be truthful, I'm a tad bit nervous. For many reasons it's difficult for me to stand here and say our justice system is not just, but for many it has never been just. But for those of us of white privilege, of white male privilege, and those of us who have been in positions of power, we have for too long failed to hear and respond to the call for change because the justice system has worked for us. We aren't profiled because of the color of our skin. We aren't automatically su a suspect because of the color of our skin. And we aren't assumed guilty because of the color of our skin. But this is happening to people in our communities. Black mothers have to tell their children, keep your hands out of your pockets when you go into a store or you could be accused of stealing. Don't put your hood over your head as you're walking down the street. You may look suspicious. Be careful when you go outside of your neighborhood or people might call the police because you look like you don't belong. When you are pulled over by police, not if, but when you are pulled over by police, show your hands, don't talk back. This is the lived reality 
of many black people in our cities and our communities. Street checks, surveillance, suspicion. White people don't need to think about these things. Black people can't afford not to. Our system of justice, from policing to courts to corrections, have failed many members of our black community. A system that is supposed to keep you safe, but because of the color of your skin, you fear it. Today, I say enough. I want you to know, I hear you, I see you, I believe you, and I am sorry. On behalf of my ministers, our, my caucus, our government, we are sorry. We are sorry to young Nova Scotians, to adults, families, and their ancestors who have been failed by racist institutions and systems. I can't take away your pain. I can't bring back opportunity, lost opportunities or lives. Around the world, we have watched people gather in the streets to demand change, calling for a just future in which black lives matter. I am here today to say this moment will not pass, as so many other moments for change have passed. The leaders of the official opposition is here, Tim Houston, leader of the NDP, Gary Burrell is here. We are here in a non-partisan way, and I want to thank both of you for coming. To the police officers in the room and to other members of the justice system, I know this is not easy to hear, not easy to face. But you being in this room means you are open to change. To members of our black community, our indigenous communities, and to our most vulnerable and marginalized who are also been let down by this system because the issues around poverty, mental health, gender and gender identity, your wisdom and lived experience matter. A new approach will require a shared commitment to fundamental change. It will require us all to be brave and bold. And it will require us to rethink assumptions, institutions, systems, mandates, missions, and practices. And thank you to everyone here today for opening your hearts and minds to reimagine a system of justice in Nova Scotia where regardless of the color of your skin, your cultural background, or your economic position, you are treated with respect and dignity. You feel safe and secure, and that you belong and you can live without fear or hesitation. That's a justice system that works for all, but that is not our current justice system. The time for diagnosing the problem has passed. It's now time for fundamental change. Today I am announcing a restorative process to transform policing and public safety in Nova Scotia. This will require new ways of doing things, and it starts with a commitment across systems and services, all levels of government, to work with communities for change. To help us do this, we've designed a team, a design team has, has been appointed and that is the first phase of this restorative process. The team will include members of government, police, justice, and community. You will meet the design team shortly. It is led by Jake McIsaac and along with Jennifer Llewellyn. I want to thank you both for taking on this such important task. The team is empowered to design a restorative approach that will transform public safety in Nova Scotia. There are several actions currently underway that will be important elements of the success of the work ahead. We are, following on, we are following through on our commitments from the restorative inquiry for the home for colored children. Count us in. Our action plan to respond to the United Nations decade of people of African descent. Resolving land titles in black communities. The Wortley Report. We've also been working to address domestic violence through the Standing Together Initiative as well as our Indigenous Justice Strategy. This work matters, but this restorative process will go deeper to ensure that it leads to fundamental and systemic change. It will require significant changes in our laws, our policies, and practices. The current system is broken, and the only way to fix it is to find a better way, a more just way. Imagine that black mother not needing to warn her children when they go outside. Instead, 
encouraging them to have fun and be who they are. Let's not imagine it anymore. Let's not wait. The time for change is now. Let's step up and step into this moment. Let's change the system together. Thank you, Premier, for your words, for this moment, for acknowledging the voices and experiences of historically marginalized folks across this province, for saying unequivocally that black lives matter here. Your commitment to undertake a careful examination across the various systems and structures that, continue, that contribute to creating and maintaining safe communities is welcome and timely. When considering apologies, there is saying sorry, which is always important. There's being sorry, often brought on through learning and building understanding. But the proof of an apology will be in the going forward and doing differently. This is an action moment. My name is Jake McIsaac, and it's my privilege to co-facilitate with Jennifer Llewellyn this restorative approach to reimagining and transforming public safety in Nova Scotia. We are joined in this endeavor by a group of dedicated individuals pledging to invest their time and expertise in designing a process of change. You will hear from a few of the design team members uh, momentarily, and following their comments, I will introduce the names of other team members as well, many of whom are in the room, but in the interest of time, we opted to give you a cross-section of the team this morning. Members of the design team were not only chosen because of their subject matter knowledge, diverse experiences, and community connections, all of which will be drawn upon in tackling the issue of inequity and systemic racism across public safety systems, but also because they were courageous enough to believe in and commit to this shift. Each team member has expressed a desire to make a difference and an insistence that this will not be another review, resulting in another report on a shelf. This is about mobilizing and creating the conditions and connections needed for action and change. Recognizing that we stand on the shoulders of all the work of the past that has shown so clearly the problems and failing and the need for fundamental change. We are clearly committed to doing this work in a different way. Our work will not be simply for communities and systems, but with them. This work will center the voices, needs, and vision of people around the province in order to come to understand public safety from their perspectives and determine what is needed to secure it. It also signifies that this group includes wisdom from a far range of experiences and perspectives. They bring with them that knowledge and these relationships, and we want that to matter. This is not a committee or an advisory group. Folks were not selected as representatives of specific organizations or by group affiliation. It is our intention that the design team will seek broad stakeholder participation by reaching out and drawing community in. They will facilitate hard conversations between stakeholders to hear what is needed for change and chart a way forward. We've already heard from design team members that it's important for them to work in transparent, and collaborative ways. We know that the responsibility for public safety related to policing lies with the justice system, but at its core, caring for what it takes to make communities safe is the business of many connected systems. We must pay attention to the intersecting needs and ways people have been marginalized so we can bring about this change. 
moving forward, working to ensure all Nova Scotians have faith and trust in these institutions and feel like they can play their full part in courageously reimagining public safety, I would like to invite my fellow design team members to share from their perspectives why this moment and this opportunity matters to them. Good morning. Um, um, I just want to share a little bit about why I agreed to be a part of this design team. Um, I needed a reference point to why um, I think this work is important enough for me to be involved in. And I thought this is an opportunity to reimagine public safety for our most vulnerable citizens. As a social worker, I see firsthand how the imbalance of our unjust social structures of systemic racism negatively affect all African Nova Scotians, women experiencing intimate partner violence, and those experiencing homelessness. And I think, think about why it's important to commit to be a part of the design team, is that um, I have seen how collaboration with community, government, and public service can affect people's lives directly, as it has done in the work of the restorative inquiry approach to the Home for Colored Children. So for me, the yes came with some expectations of, de of, of the design to have action, because that's what's most important for me. Um, and we know that public safety means different things to different people, and it looks differently as well. So truly affordable housing is another important opportunity to reimagine safety for all of us. And I'm looking forward to this opportunity to uh, in enact change in our systems. Thank you. morning. In his Nine Principles of Policing, Sir Robert Peel reminds us, the power of the police to fulfill their function and duties is dependent on public approval of their existence, actions, behaviors, and their ability to secure and maintain the public trust. As police, we have heard the call across cities and communities in Nova Scotia that it's time for change. And we know that it's time for us to show up and to have the hard conversations. I am very pleased to have been selected for the design team. As a senior police leader and as president of Nova Scotia Chiefs, I can participate and have meaningful input into this process. I am here to listen without being defensive, to hear what African Nova Scotian and other diverse communities are experiencing in their interactions with the police and the justice system. And I can then take what I learned back to all police chiefs, many of whom are here in the room with me today, so that we can learn and adapt. Thank you. Candace Thomas. Thank you and good morning. Let me start by saying I normally put very little stock in apologies, but I found my heart racing when the Premier was speaking. And from the bottom of my heart, I want to say thank you, Premier McNeil. I think I may have just said minister. But Premier McNeil, I, I get it now. I get it when an apology is coupled with action that it can and will make a difference. Like most people, I have been listening to the wide range of public voices speaking up in this pivotal moment of challenge. Voices speaking up against anti-black racism against anti-Indigenous racism, against long-standing issues in policing across North America. Among other things, these voices, including some in this room, call out for solutions. I join government because I want to be part of solutions that make a positive difference in the lives of Nova Scotians. The establishment of the Office of Social Innovation and Integrative Approaches shows government's intention to develop a new way of government, 
a new way of governing, one that puts people first. I have the privilege to serve as the Deputy Minister of this new office, as well as Deputy Minister of Justice and Deputy Attorney General. With the Premier's apology and announcement today, government, law enforcement, and community are coming together to collectively do the right thing, designing the roadmap for meaningful systemic change towards racial justice in public safety in this province. This is important to me professionally, and it matters to me personally. We owe those who have tirelessly pushed for change across generations, those who, in the name of John Lewis, have gotten into good trouble, necessary trouble, to bring that change to life here and now. So I am proud to be a part of this journey towards change, change that I truly believe will reverberate through all aspects of government and our society in Nova Scotia. Thank you. Shakira Weatherdon. I did have something written down, but I think the ancestors want to speak something else, so bear with me. Those who are nervous, don't be. This is more than a moment. And as we stand here speaking about public safety, there are members of our own community in various parts of this province advocating for rights, standing for their rights. I think about our sisters and brothers in the Digby area who are asserting their treaty rights. I think about those who are seeing the impact of Black Lives Matter being painted on our streets and having to talk and, and, and teach through trauma. I accepted this opportunity because it builds on that trauma and that experience and expertise and work that many before me have done. And I'm not just speaking about the reports, but I'm speaking about all the work that went into those reports that many of us don't get to see. We are building off on that. And it's also really important that we recognize that this is a complex issue. It isn't just happening across uh, borders and elsewhere, it's happening here. It's about interlocking systems of oppression, but also, in, also intersecting uh, experiences of oppression and inequity. And so for me, I'm really looking forward to having the opportunity to reflect and to meaningfully reimagine what it means to be my brother's keeper, my sister's keeper in this province. I look forward to centering the voice of communities in this work because without it, we cannot do any of this work. Public safety is about people, it is about their experiences, and I look forward to an opportunity that aims to center that. Thank you. Martin Morrison. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Martin Morrison, um, and I'm the Regional Coordinator of African Canadian Education for Tri-County Regional Centre for Education. Uh, personally, I'm a father, a grandfather, a son, brother, uncle, nephew, cousin, and a proud member of the African Nova Scotian community of Danvers. As a result of my lived experiences as a student and as an educator over the last 16 years, I witnessed firsthand how systemic inequities in our education system have disproportionately impacted African Nova Scotian learners, families, and communities. As a result of systemic racism, African Nova Scotian learners are overly represented on individual program plans, disproportionately suspended, and disproportionately score lower on provincial assessments, as compared to other Nova Scotians. This negative interconnection between education and public safety, specifically policing and the justice system, is commonly referred to as a school to prison pipeline. This cycle must be broken. What compels me to participate in this work is the African Nova Scotian community has never feared speaking truth to power. And this is a legacy that I am proud to be a part of. And given the incidences of racism captured on video, 
including the murder of George Floyd and its subsequent global Black Lives Matter and anti-black racism movement, now is a moment for action. It is my hope through this process that our respective institutions will listen, acknowledge, and respond to these inequities negatively impacting our children and families, my children and my families. I'm pleased to have this opportunity as well as to be affiliated with the people connected to this process. Thank you. Shelly Martin. I just want to say I'm really hot and nervous, but um, I have a few remarks prepared here, but I just wanted to, um, as I was thinking about this, about why me um, and why this moment is particularly important, I was reflecting on uh, a time when I was a Mi'kma law student across the street at the Dalhousie Legal Aid Service. And I was uh, set to tackle my first solo client, intertake, uh, client uh, intake interview. And I was really excited and really determined and convinced uh, in my youth and uh, naivete that I could solve every legal problem uh, that the, the woman I was deemed to meet was facing. And when she came into my office, uh, she was very disheveled and disclosed that she was homeless, uh, that she was an addict, that she had lost her identification uh, due to circumstances that she was living in, which made it very difficult for her to access uh, medical services, complicated her access to social services. And she said that she was hungry. And so I went to the kitchen over at the legal aid clinic and I was making her a tea and I realized in that moment that not a single piece of law that I knew would help her be safe and warm that night, would help her manage her addiction and would help her, you know, be, feed herself and find a meal when she was hungry. And I think in that moment I really felt like law was a fairly small <laughs> toolbox with a, a pretty limited set of tools uh, at, my, at my disposal. And I think, you know, generally, you know, when we think about law, we perceive it as being, as having the ability to parse facts and to look at evidence and determine guilt or innocence, but it doesn't really address all of the things that come before uh, in a person's life that bring us, that bring them uh, into our offices seeking help, right? So I think law, you know, and I realized, you know, throughout my career that law has really been focused on how the ways in which people hurt each other, but doesn't address the ways in which we need to support each other and to come together. Um, and I think this process really recognizes the fact that justice requires something more in order for it to be truly just. And, um, you know, we, as society changes, as you know, so too must law. And I get the sense that we have to, we have a pretty good understanding of, of what law can do, but we have to reconceptualize, you know, what we expect of justice uh, in our communities and for all Nova Scotians. Uh, I'm a big fan of Andale Denny, who is the Grand Captain of the, Nova, of the Mi'kmaq Grand Council. And I was at a, meeting once and Andale described the Mi'kmaq as being a nation of people who help each other. And I think it's true also of all Nova Scotians that we are blessed here with a generosity of spirit that, and that we all agree that we need to do more to help those who are most vulnerable and marginalized among us. And so, you know, when we talk about the why, that is the why for me, that there, I think we all recognize that there is a distinct uh, need for change. We've all lived it. The indigenous community has lived it. The black community has lived it. And it's time to actually, you know, <laughs> set the, you know, the various reports uh, aside and, and take what we've learned from them and be guided by the wisdom uh, and the, the truth in our communities to come together and make sure that this work gets done. So for me, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs> Kate McDonald.
Hello, everyone. As mentioned, my name is Kate McDonald. I want to give it up one time for the black people in the room. So I like wrote things down and then I didn't write things down and then I wrote notes as people were speaking. So why is this important for me? I'm a proudly African Nova Scotian, something that I carry very close to my heart. And I think the other option is to leave this work the same as it currently stands and that option is literally deadly for black people. Um, transforming policing actually doesn't really exist. It's not about reform right now uh, because policing was born with racism as its backbone. So we need to recreate something with a new backbone born out of something else. Uh, I'm hoping that this process uh, involves reparations and is reparatory because there's a lot of mistrust between African Nova Scotian communities and the police and the justice system. I'm an African Nova Scotian mother, an African Nova Scotian community member. I am the African Nova Scotian black folks who couldn't, can't, and wouldn't be here today and who might never be invited. I bring them with me. That to say this announcement is a pretty big promise and I am just but one voice at the table. So this comes with big expectations on the other side. So what do y'all wanna do? What are you willing to give up? Thank you. I wanna say thank you to the uh, members of the design team who, who spoke to us this morning and invite the other members who are here to stand as I uh, call your name so you folks can see who they are. Uh, Jennifer Llewellyn, uh, co-facilitating. Co uh, Paula Marshall, Craig, Craig Smith, Emma Halpern, Jean Flynn, Tony Smith, Tr Tracy Tweel, Winnie Grant, Lindell Smith, Richard Dereeb, Wayne Hamilton, <laughs> Stephanie McGinnis Langley, and Dean Smith. We are eager to get this design phase of the restorative work underway, and we look forward to the task of reimagining public safety in Nova Scotia together. Thank you for being here today. Now, it's my understanding that following the event, the Premier will be available uh, to the media for questions. In order to facilitate that, we ask that uh, all the others, uh, the rest of us, um, would exit to the right, um, taking all the precautions related to social distancing. Again, thank you very much.
yep, sure. One, two, three, four, five, six, ten, nine, two. That's why I'm not the finance minister. So this has been uh, in the works now for a number of months, uh, back and forth, uh, looking at trying to imagine uh, what a design process and a restorative process would look like uh, uh, for public safety and policing. Uh, bearing in mind, we relied on uh, some of the work we did around the Home for Colour Children. This is a, obviously a much broader uh, conversation. Uh, so I started that uh, with Jennifer Llewellyn and Jake, uh, and uh, then uh, they were charged with reaching out into the community to identify people uh, that should uh, sit on that, and my job was to identify that uh, the people in government who needed to be at that table would be at the table, the ones that could affect change, uh, and the departments that would be most impacted. So the design team will start. Uh, it'll take probably about the same length of time as we did with the, uh, the, the Home for Colour Children, about 18 months. Uh, uh, you will start seeing action. Uh, in my remarks, I laid out some of the things that we're currently doing. Uh, this is not to put all of that on hold. It's to continue to march uh, on the path that we've had uh, with uh, the recommendations that have been brought forward. Uh, but this is actually to go deeper, uh, to look at some of the systemic issues that are in institutions, uh, including government institutions. Uh, the issue of policing uh, was the wedge into what I believe will become a very bigger, uh, become a very uh, a much broader uh, conversation in social justice. Well, for example, street checks, uh, we've already uh, said those are no longer part of policing. We need to look at other uh, aptitudes of how we deliver uh, services, or how we deliver policing in this province. And part of that, and the reason the design team is there, uh, we will hear from community, from those that have experienced uh, the justice system that hasn't been just for them, and then we will begin to implement those changes in policies and practices. Pardon? Police stops. So there, I mean, I know street checks have been banned, but the police can still stop people on the street, on the, and, you know, in the cars. I'm wondering how, how are those stops being regulated? Are there, is there data being collected? Uh, who's being stopped? Is there a race? Well, police checks have been and banned in our province. There's obviously uh, law enforcement still continuing. People are being stopped uh, from one end of the province to the other if, if police believe uh, there's issues of uh, law enforcement. Uh, what we're saying is that needs to be uh, rooted in issues of law, not in the color of your skin. Uh, and that's what this practice has continued for, but I haven't followed uh, what that data would look like today. I, th I think when you look at what's happening globally, uh, and you, uh, you see the outcry uh, from the global community, but when you come back to our province, um, you're seeing not just black Nova Scotians or indigenous Nova Scotians saying the time is now, you're seeing all Nova Scotians say the time is now. My children are demanding action. They're not demanding that we stay and protect a system that has protected me. They want action. They want their friends to be treated in the system the same way they want to be treated in the system. Uh, and I believe their collective voices uh, makes this the moment in time. Uh, there's a desire among law enforcement. They are hearing the outcry. 
that the current system is not working for everyone. And it's not just police, it's corrections, it's judiciary, all of this has to be part of this conversation. And I believe after that, we'll start getting into some of the socioeconomic issues. You know, when we are now graduating more African Nova Scotians than Indigenous people ever before in our history, and we're attaching fewer of them to the workforce, something's wrong. Something, there's an inequity that can't be, we cannot let stand. And, and if it's not now, when? Absolutely, absolutely. And it was meant to encompass the systemic racism in our system, uh, whether it's dealing with street checks, the overrepresentation of, of African Nova Scotian Mingba people in our justice system. Listen, you were all here when we looked at our Children in Care Act. You recognized that we did not take culture into account. We were taking young African Nova Scotia kids into care and taking them out of their community taking them out of their culture. We did the same thing with the Mi'kmaq community. You saw a system that was full of racism when we had the uh, home for colored children, when we were providing no training for the staff, and the per diem was half of that for white kids we were caring for. If that's not systemic racism, I don't know what is. We need to acknowledge that. And that is, not, that is in all of our systems. We need to be honest and have a frank conversation. When there are generations of black people living on land they don't own, I don't know what else you would call it. They, only, they don't own it because of the color of their skin. That's not acceptable. Uh, it never should have been acceptable, but it's certainly not acceptable today. So the, the, those seats are being filled now, but Andrew, if you want a negative story, you can find one. There's no, you, don't, you can find all kinds of points. You can find a negative story if that's what you want to take out of this. This is a typical approach to you when it comes to a story. This is about systemic racism in the system. We had a room full of people, law enforcement, judiciary, community, standing up and saying the time is now. The time is now to fix the injustice. And you're piddling around to a committee? Come on, do better by your readers. You should do better by your readers and you know you should. So this won't be a case where at 18 months all of a sudden there will be a recommendations for us to implement. We'll get recommendations throughout these 18 months. Uh, I, I, re I referenced you earlier, we talked about uh, the Family and Children Care Act. Well part of the changes made in that act came out of the, the restorative process around the Home for Colored Children. So we will get recommendations throughout the entire process and we'll begin to implement and make those changes. Uh, but it will take uh, 18 months for us to see this through to the end. I think all of these are part of that, you know, and there won't be one magic moment where we say we have fixed this. What we're talking about is systemic cultural issues that we need to call out and be able to rectify when decisions are being made. The biases on top of those decisions don't include racism and in, if for African Nova Scotian Indigenous or quite frankly marginalized people in our community. That's, we'll take, uh, uh, this is not something that all of a sudden tomorrow we're going to be able to say we solved that problem. It is, about it is about shaping the system that will then change the lives of children and, gra and grandchildren of people who've been quite frankly oppressed in this province. That's what this is about and, and any time you're talking about a system change, it's not something that happens at, the, at the, uh, uh, the wave of a magic wand. It takes hard work and it takes a long period of time to continue to make those changes in systems. And it'd be a life, if I can, just someone answer this you. It's a lifetime, it's, it's a work of, of a lifetime. It's, it's something that has to be continually part and put in the forefront. 
There will never be a time when we can say that's finished. This is a lifetime project. Uh, no, they will be part of, uh, so the police are part of this committee. Uh, they've all come, uh, all, you've seen the RCP were here today, the Halifax Police, the municipal forces across the province. They will be there as part of that. The justice system will be there. Those recommendations come to government. So government is the, will be the people who have to implement the changes in laws uh, within the province. What we're embedding in here is independence to this committee. It'll be the same as we did for the Home for Color Children. Their, uh, their recommendations will be made public. Uh, government will have to justify why they don't act on them, quite frankly. Uh, this will all be uh, as part of the commitment, and you heard Jake talk about being, uh, they want to be able for people to see the work they're doing, uh, and it'll be presented to government. And if there's laws required, government will have to change those laws. If there's practicing and policing, those are directives that are sent out uh, by either the Attorney General, Justice Minister, or quite frankly, police chiefs across this province. Uh, Chief Chiquetto, who you heard speak here, has been passionate about uh, the changes that she wants to see. Uh, in law enforcement, uh, and she's looking forward to being part of this. Well, they'll be looking at a number of things. That, there's, there's nothing off limits, but I think the questions, for example, health, uh, wellness checks, should police be doing those? When it comes to having children that we take into care, should it be police picking those children up, or should it be social workers? Should that be government's responsibility? Those are the kinds of uh, conversations as part of this work. Uh, what happens, what, what is the interaction between uh, African Nova Scotians and, and, and law enforcement, the impact that we will hear from the table, uh, those are the things that will come from it and we'll, re and we'll respond to their lived experience. Uh, we're just asking some questions from a systems point of view, but we need to have their input and their lived experience, quite frankly, for us uh, to be able to make those an effective change. So they're in, obviously in negotiations right now with the national government about what does a moderate, moderate livelihood mean in fishery. Uh, we're waiting to see how that works out. Uh, I've said that it's my belief and it's quite frankly all the people should be at the table here, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous fishermen along with DFO, uh, to find a path forward uh, on what is a moderate uh, livelihood fishery. Uh, and then, of course, we would work with them uh, to find out what that path would look like in terms of uh, sale. But until we know what that looks like, until the national government who has charge of the fishery can come to a resolution with the Mi'kmaq Nation and uh, commercial fisheries, uh, we, don't have, we don't have something to respond to because we don't know what the change would look like. Uh, what is the mandate? The mandate, the mandate is to look uh, across uh, uh, public safety in our province, uh, looking at the systemic issues that have been inherent for generations and deliver uh, fixes that we as government can implement to change so that more Nova Scotians actually see themselves reflected in a safe and secure community instead of some of us feeling afraid in, uh, of being in some of our communities. So what you'll find out uh, coming from that team, they will lay out a recommendation about systematic change. That change won't end in 18 months. We'll continue to have to implement that over, over time. We'll be held to account, or governments will be held to account uh, by the design team and community. Uh, so this is, even though the design team's life may be 18 months, the work will certainly go well beyond that. And quite honestly, it'll be a lifetime of work, of continually ensuring that our systems uh, are, are not uh, racist, that people don't fear. I grew up, quite frankly, feeling secure around police, feeling part of that. Too many people in this province don't. Too many people feel the justice system isn't there for them. That won't, we won't fix that in 18 months. It will take hard conversations. It will take the confidence of the community to believe in government, to believe in the, in, the insincerity and honesty of government to deliver on that change. And if we continue, go through and make those changes year after year, time over time, 
we will, I think, begin to see a more just province, one where people are, are not afraid of the system, they'll embrace the system, quite frankly, see themselves in the system in a positive way, not a negative way, and that work will continue for long after not only my government, but future governments uh, are gone.